If you would take your Bible out to James chapter 5, for those of you that maybe this is your first time at Britain Christian Church or uh, you've, you've not been here regularly, I, I need to explain to you. We've been working our way through James' letter. The letter of James is a powerful uh, part of the New Testament, and we start in verse 1. And today we're turning over into James chapter 5. We're going to take a look at the first six verses of James chapter 5. There are many things that can be said about Jesus' younger half-brother, James. But if you've been with us during our study, then you know that beating around the bush, or being bashful, or catering to his congregation, those things are not on the list. Throughout James' letter to those early followers of Jesus, he has put a finger on those places of their heart, and our hearts as well, that need to be examined and confessed and transformed by the power of the gospel. James is not in the least bit impressed by Christians who talk the talk, but he is very, very concerned, greatly concerned that the followers of Jesus walk the walk. In the very first chapter of his letter, he said this, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <clears throat> if you've been with us throughout our study of James, and there's no doubt that you at one point or another, probably at many points, have felt James' finger poking you and prodding you at times. James has caused me to stop and to really examine different aspects of my daily life. I shared with you just a few weeks ago while we were studying James' insistence that we not slander one another. What a deep impact that that study made on me that week. If you'll remember, slander, uh, in our day, slander is saying something wrong about someone else, an untruth about somebody, smearing somebody's name. But biblically speaking, from God's vantage point, you can be telling an absolute truth about somebody, but telling that truth to diminish them in the eyes of those around them. And for God, that's slander. We are to speak those things that build one another up according to their needs. Well, it's been with me, that study from James 4.11 ever since. And I'm grateful, I'm really grateful that James poked and prodded at my heart, reminding me to watch what I say at all times. In our lesson for today, found in James 5, we find another area that we really don't like to talk about, and that's money and power. This isn't the first time that James has brought up the topic of money. There are five sections, five major sections in James 5 chapter and letter where he addresses the topic of money. That's in James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, in James 1, 27. Then there's two places in chapter 2. In James 2, verses 1 through 7, and in James 2, 14 through 17. And the fifth place is right here, in James 5, verses 1 through 6, where he deals with the topics of money and power. James doesn't address money and power in a theoretical sense, but rather he tackles the topic with real-life situations like, for example, favoritism being shown to wealthy people over poor people in the church, and people who say that they're followers of Jesus, who then send the poor and needy away with nothing more than a prayer. Why is money such a touchy topic? I've heard people say, that's why I don't go to church. The church is always talking about money. And that's why I prefaced our lesson by saying, hey, those of you that just happened to stop in here today, you need to know that we are working our way through five chapters of James. And we didn't get a tip that you were going to show up so we could pound you for your checkbook today. We just, and we've been doing this for years. We start with the book of the Bible and we go one verse at a time and here you are today. Well, that's not the case that money only becomes uncomfortable when it's a topic that's talked about in church. I know, I, I've done premarital counseling with hundreds of couples in the 28 years that I've been here. And I share with every one of them. There are three main reasons why couples divorce, and money is one of those three reasons. Couples argue about money. Kids and parents argue about money. It's a major topic of conversation. I'll never forget as long as I live one of my mom's favorite lines. Mike, 
Do you think I have a money tree in the backyard? Did any of your mom say the same thing? She didn't. She didn't have a money tree in the backyard. It's no wonder. I mean, because everybody thinks they need more money. It's no wonder that Jesus spoke about money so often. The power of money, the deceptiveness of money, the allure of money, and the potential destruction that money can bring about when we don't understand God's purpose and intent for giving us the financial resources that he has. Jesus spoke about it often. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus taught were about money and possessions. Jesus used parables, like the parable of the pearl of great price, the lost coin, and the parable of the talents, to teach important lessons for those who had ears to hear. He also told other parables, like the parable of the prodigal son, who squandered away his whole inheritance. Lazarus and the rich man, and, and Luke chapter 16, and the day laborers who worked in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20 to teach some powerful lessons to those who were around him. Some of Jesus' most familiar sayings come about this very topic. Some of the most memorable things that Jesus said. How about this one? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or how about this one? You cannot serve both God and See there? From Matthew 6. I believe the difficulty that we have, and by me, by we, I don't mean just those that are here today. I believe the top the difficulty that we, being the followers Jesus have in talking about money, stems from the fact that we are convinced that we have ownership over our money. You can't tell me what to do with my money. I work hard for my money. You don't realize how hard I've worked to get where I'm at, and you're not going to tell me what to do with my money. All of those things are said often. The Bible teaches something much different than ownership. The Bible teaches that we have stewardship, that we are caretakers of the resources that God has blessed us with in life. Money, our wealth, is a blessing from God. But if we don't understand the purpose of money and how God intends for us to use the resources that he has blessed us with, then my friend, let me tell you, money intended by God to be a blessing to you and me, it can become an all-consuming monster. Well, let's take a look at our scripture found in James 5, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll see what we can learn. Now listen, you rich people. Boy, that's a great way to build a church, isn't it? <clears throat> now listen, you rich people, weep and well because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth is rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter or for the day of slaughter, either one. You've condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Before we dig in, I want you to know I understand how some of you responded to the scripture that was just read. Some of you were thinking, well, man, I could have stayed home today. I'm the furthest thing in the world from rich. Mike's not going to have a thing to say that's going to help me this morning. Well, others of you bristled. It's like James is pointing a long finger of condemnation at us, and we don't want to hear it. Why, we would never consider ourselves to be tight-fisted or hard-hearted, so we just shut down. As soon as we heard, listen up, you rich. Whoop, la, 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 la. Build a wall, shut it down. And I want you to know both of those responses will keep you and me from hearing what God has to teach all of us this morning. I want you to consider something. <clears throat> First of all, to those who say, I'm the furthest thing from the rich. 
I'm the furthest thing from rich. I want you to consider something. We live, this is a fact, we live in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. A single person making less than $14,000 a year in America is considered living under the poverty level by our government. A family of four who makes $28,000 a year falls just below the poverty level, according to our government. Now, there's no doubt that if you live below the poverty level, and there are many people in our church who do, if you live below the poverty level, it is a financial struggle. But I want you to consider something. 80% of the world's population lives on less than, than $10 a day. 80% of the there are 7 billion people on the planet. And 80% of them live on $10 or less a day. That's $300 a month. So even those among us who are living right at the poverty level or below the poverty level, we are filthy rich. When you look at the world. And for those of us who have been incredibly blessed with great financial resources, we desperately need to hear God's word coming to us this morning. I got news for you. We cannot afford to throw up a wall or to become defensive. We have to be constantly aware of the deceptiveness of wealth. And we need, to be, we need constant reminders from God about why he has blessed us with the financial resources that he's given to us. He has not given them to us to build our own kingdom. We'll get around to that before we leave here this morning, but first let's look at verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, weep and well because of the misery that is coming upon you. The question's been raised by Bible teachers concerning who James had in mind when he wrote these verses. Some say he was writing to wealthy members of the church. Dan Doriani writes this. There are reasons to believe that James is, a, is addressing rich Christians. First, who would read or hear James' letter but believers who have assembled for worship or fellowship? Second, all Christians are prone to the temptation of their age and social group, to their culture. If rich believers adopt the lifestyle of their social peers, they can forget the biblical principles of justice and brotherhood that prevent abuse. Since no Christian is beyond the temptation to abuse power, James seems to be warning wealthy believers about temptation as they face. And there's no doubt that Dr. Doriani is right in saying that we so easily follow our culture. And our culture is constantly pounding us that wealth and success are the golden rung on the ladder that all of us need to be striving for. <clears throat> Our society is saturated with success. Excess is marketed towards us each and every day. And we've become, we've become convinced because our society has taught us that money and more of it is the answer to all of our problems. Those things are true, but the vast majority of Bible teachers believe that James is not writing to rich Christians within the church. The vast majority of Bible teachers believe that James is writing to wealthy landowners who are outside of the church, who were abusing their workers, who were using the courts to take what little the poor have. Let me share some reasons with you why Bible teachers believe this. First, James and other places in his letter, if you've been here with us, James refers to them as brothers or brothers and sisters. In James chapter 4, he says, brothers, do not slander one another. When he says tough things to brothers and sisters in Christ, he addresses them as family. He doesn't do that here. He just says, listen up, you rich people. <clears throat> Second, he's not calling these folks to repent. He's calling them to weep and wail. And last of all, he can already see their judgment in view. James holds out no hope for their salvation. What James is doing is what the prophets of the Old Testament did over and over and over again. If you read Isaiah or Ezekiel or Obadiah or Amos, you'll find them declaring, Thus saith the Lord to the nation of Assyria or the Babylonians or Edom or Ammon, these judgments, and yet there's nobody from those nations there to hear. But the people of God are there to hear. And that's what many believe James is doing here. 
the great Bible teacher John Calvin, he believed James had this in mind. Listen to what he writes. James has a regard for the faithful. That they, hearing of the miserable end of the rich, might not envy their fortune. And also, knowing that God would be the avenger of the wrongs that they were suffering, those within the church, that they might with a calm and resigned mind bear those injustices. So by listening to James in his letter, listen up you rich people, and he gives this judgment that those in the poor, the oppressed, those who didn't have, that they would hear that and go, you know what, I shouldn't be envying those folks. And you know what, what I'm going through, God knows right where I'm at. And he's going to defend me, and he will take up my cause. It needs to be said, James doesn't condemn wealth. That's something different about our society. Hello. In America today, we find this widening gulf. And people who have a lot of money, man, they are just torched in the public square. They don't pay their fair share. They don't do this. They don't do that. And those who have less than, they are the ones who mouth those words. Well, you need to realize, and hopefully you've noticed it, no, regardless of whether you make a lot or a little, you came here today, and maybe if you aren't wealthy, you came here today, and you heard me reading James, you go, uh-huh, man, I'm glad I'm here. Mike's going to let them have it today. And then you learn you are them. You see, James doesn't condemn well. He condemns the misuse of wealth. James doesn't condemn money, having money. He condemns the misuse of the resources that God gives to us. Throughout God's word, we learn wealth is a blessing from God. I mean, just look at, read the life stories of people like Abraham and Joseph and Job and David, Joseph of Arimathea, Lydia, all of them were extravagantly wealthy and each and every one of them traced their wealth straight to the sovereign hand of God. The problem arises when we don't understand that it is God who has blessed us. Not just Abraham and Joseph and Lydia, but each and every one of us. He has blessed us with our financial blessings. Not keeping money in its proper place can lead to all kinds of problems as it did for those that James had in mind. James highlights four actions on behalf of the rich that he's writing to, that he has in mind in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. James comes down hard on those who, number one, hoard their wealth, those who commit fraud and oppression, those who are self-indulgent, and those who commit violence. I want you to notice something. James tells the rich to weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. The word wail in Greek, it means a cry, an inarticulate, loud cry that expresses the great stress of the soul. If you have ever heard someone wailing those deep, gut-wrenching, guttural, wrenching moans and cries, then you understand what James has in mind when he tells the rich to weep and wail. Why are they weeping and wailing? Well, he answers that question in verses 2 and 3. Your wealth is rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last day. You see, they're weeping and wailing. They haven't, they, they haven't seen this happen yet. But James writes as if it's already happened. The rotting, the moths eating the clothes. And they're weeping and wailing because those those are the things that were most important to them in all of life. What they had was more important than anything else. And yet God's judgment is coming. And on the day of judgment, none of their prized possessions, their luxurious home, their stock portfolios, or bank accounts will be worth one thin dime. This reminds me of something Ezekiel said in his day to the people. In Ezekiel 7 verse 19, Ezekiel writes, they will throw their silver into the street. Wow. And their gold will be an unclean thing. Their silver and gold will not be able to save them in the day of the Lord's wrath. They will not satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it. 
for it has made them stumble into sin. Folks, money is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Can I get an amen? Money is a wonderful tool. But money is a horrible, horrendous savior. We can't trust in money to bring us satisfaction and meaning in life. Or to provide us with an identity. Or to provide us with security. I don't care how big of a wall you can build around your house. Now you need to recognize our society promises that money and the more you get, the more you will have, the more you will be able to accumulate the satisfaction you will gain. The more money you have, the more satisfaction you will enjoy, the more prestige you will garner in society, and the more security we will experience in life. And I want you to know, I'm here to burst the bubble. It's not true. It is just not true. I read a story this past week about a man named Peter Grandy. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him, but he was a high school dropout. He got stabbed his junior year and dropped out of school and never went back, but he was brilliant. He got interested in the stock market, in the market, and he self-educated himself. And, uh, man, he got the Midas touch. Everything he touched turned to gold. At the age of 31, he was dubbed the Wall Street whiz kid. And by the time he was in his mid-30s, he had made millions. He and his wife bought several homes. They bought several expensive race horses. They bought several, they bought multiples of everything. Several very expensive race cars. His wife was a devout follower of Jesus. And Peter said that he went to church with her whenever, on occasion. But he did give lots of money to her church. And in his words, mainly for show. The truth is, Peter never gave Jesus a thought. He was too busy making money. Peter made millions by the time he was in his mid-30s. And then he hit a dry spell. He lost some of his money and became so obsessed with holding on to his fortune that he suffered these horrible panic attacks. He began to suffer great anxiety and depression. And after his second suicide attempt, the police took him to a psychiatric ward. And there in that psychiatric ward, he met a homeless man that he developed a relationship with. And there was something about that homeless man that sparked the thoughts of his wife. All of the things that his wife had said about God and her relationship with Jesus and her devotion and the peace that she had. And her seeming unattachment to the money that he was making. She didn't seem to be affected by that. And there, Peter Grandy surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. When he got out of the psychiatric unit and got to go back home and life began to resume uh, some sense of normalcy, he began to go to Bible study every week and he resolved the same way he poured himself into learning about the markets, he was going to pour himself into learning about God and about Jesus and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that's what he did. And as Peter read the Bible, he discovered in the Bible, not in an Ivy League school, but he learned in the Bible that money is a miserable solution to life problems. Today, Peter understands about the fortune that he has from the perspective of what Paul shared with Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. For Paul said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life, get this, Isn't that awesome? You see, hoarding our wealth, hoarding our wealth so we can accumulate as much as we possibly can for ourselves and for our own pleasure, it will never bring satisfaction. Peter Grandich wasn't the first person to discover that. Solomon, who is the wealthiest man that ever lived, he said this, whoever loves money never has money enough. 
And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. I got to say this. Not having money, you can love money. And having a lot of money doesn't mean that you love money. I know people who have nothing and they love money. And boy, what Solomon said is so true. And I know people who have a whole lot of money, but they don't love money. They use money as a tool, as God has designed it. With money comes power. And the misuse of that power, afforded by wealth, comes under God's scrutiny over and over again in Scripture. Look at verse 4. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of their supervisors. Is that what it says? Who? The Lord Almighty. You know what literally it means? It means the Lord of the army. The cries of the harvesters, those that you've not paid what you owe them, it's reached the ears, not of their supervisors, but of the Lord of the armies. And he has aligned his forces against you for the way you've treated his people. That's what James means to convey. You see the rich landowners that James had in mind. They weren't paying their workers what they owed them. For many who do not understand that God calls us to be stewards, of the financial resources that he's provided for us, we can easily allow our money to convince us that we are somehow better than those who work for us and we can treat them accordingly, as if they're hired hands, as if they're, they're less than us. We can take advantage of them because of what we have and what they lack, but God's word is crystal clear. I mean crystal clear in how we are to treat those who work for us. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 14, God says, Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day. When? Before sunset. Because he is poor and he's counting on, he's dependent on that money. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you. Oh, that's where James got that. And you'll be guilty of sin. I have a friend who's a waitress at a steakhouse in town. She goes to this church. <clears throat> She's a good friend. She's in Bible studies that I teach. And I heard a rumor a while back. I heard that people who work in the food business, waiters and waitresses, they hate to work on Sunday because Christians are such poor tippers. And when I heard that, man, it just went through me. It broke my heart. So I went to my friend who would know better than her, right? And I said, hey, I heard this. Is it true? And she smiled and said, absolutely. The people that I work with, they hate to pull a shift on Sunday. And the people, she's talked to me quite often about the people that she works with. Very few of them there, very, very few of them there are, are Christians. They're almost all unbelievers. And so look at the scenario. Today after church, she may be there now because she wasn't in the early service or this service. So here we go after church today. You and I, there's Carol Christian and there's Chuck Christian. And we park in the parking lot and we get out with our, with our families and we even take our Bible into her restaurant. We sit down at our table, we pull out our bulletin, and we discuss with our kids all of the wonderful things that we learned in church today. We place our order, and when our order comes, we bow our head and we pray a long prayer. And then after we get through eating, we see the check, and we go, you know what? She didn't fill up my water glass the way she should have. My steak really wasn't prepared the way that I asked it to be prepared. I'll take care of that. Let me ask you something. What makes a bigger impact on that waiting? The way you bowed your head and prayed? Or how chintzy you were with her when you left? 
Mm. I hope that stings. And I hope it stings in such a way that if we go out and eat today at the church, that we will be the most generous people in that restaurant. You know why? Because isn't that the way God's been with us? Have you filled up his tea glass the way you should? Huh? And yet he lavishes blessings on us day after day. I have another friend who does yard work. He and his crews are amazing. Man, you ought to see what they can do for a flower, with a flower bed. Or how they take care of yards, making them look like carpets. He's so good at what he does, and he works long, long hours. And he's a really good friend, has been for years. We were talking one day about all the different places. He doesn't just work in Oklahoma City, outside of Oklahoma City. We were talking. He said, you know, the two toughest neighborhoods that I work in told me. I'm not going to tell you which neighborhoods they are, but I will tell you this. North Highlands was not one of them. They were two of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Oklahoma City. And I asked him, why are they so tough to work in? He said, you know, for one, they never accept my price. They ask me, how much would it cost to do this? And I tell them, and they go, well, would you take? And then when I do the work for them, they're always so slow in pain. So slow in pain. The cries of the workers have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Who ever said the Bible is outdated and irrelevant? Man, God's Word speaks to us with a clarity right where you and I live, doesn't it? Next, James points out how those he had in mind were living luxuriously. They self-indulged. In our Wednesday night Bible study, we were listening to Ravi Zacharias. He was comparing hedonism and Christianity. And hedonism, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the word, is really... Nothing more than the pursuit of pleasure and self-indulgence. Everything revolves around experiencing pleasure and indulging myself, even if it costs other people. That's the lifestyle James had in mind in verse 5. He says, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourselves in the day of slaughter. Or you might have noticed I said for the day of slaughter, because really it can, be, it can go both ways. Many people today believe that if you become a follower of Jesus, you've got to renounce all pleasure for the rest of your life. In that Bible study Wednesday night, Ravi pointed out, that's the furthest thing from the truth. God is the author of pleasure. I mean, he has created scrumptious food like hot fudge sundaes, awe-inspiring sights like sunrises in the morning, and then if that weren't enough, to close out our day, look what he gives us. Just go outside at sunset. He's created laughter and joy. Thursday night, Connie and I went to a graduation ceremony in Duncan, and at the end, after all the kids received their diploma, the whole football field, it was at the stadium, the whole football field was just full of kids and families. You know who created those emotions? God did. But when we take a gift from God, and we make it an ultimate, then my friend, you and I got problems. And the problem is we're oblivious to those problems for the longest time. It reminds me of the situation of the women of Sodom that Ezekiel wrote about in Ezekiel 16. He says, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant. They were overfed and unconcerned. They didn't help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you've seen. The women of Sodom were so consumed with their wonderful life, they did not see destruction on the horizon. It swept over them in an instant. Those are the kind of people that James has in mind. He says, those who live in luxury on earth. You see, that's the mindset. For you and me, once again, regardless of whether you have a lot or a little, you can be totally focused on this life. And trying to get all you can out of this life, when James wants to know there's more to life than what happens on the earth. 
Last of all, James ends his rebuke of those who were hoarding their wealth, withholding what was due their workers, and indulging themselves by saying, you have condemned and murdered innocent men <coughs> who were not opposing you. It's interesting that the Greek word is translated condemned. Look at it there in your Bible. You have condemned and murdered innocent men. That word in Greek is a legal term. It reminds us of something James had said in James 2 verse 6 when he said, Isn't it the rich who are hauling you into court? Hauling the, the poor into court? And here he says, the rich were known for doing the same thing, for using the legal system to take advantage of those who didn't have money to defend themselves. Dan Doriani writes, those who had power and wealth on their side, they won in court, not those who had the truth or justice. The courts were governed by patronage, clan, and tribe, not objective justice. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Is it the same thing going on today? Those who have the resources can use our legal system to take advantage of those who lack resources. I told you about Thursday, Kai and I going to Duncan. While we were driving there, I got a phone call from a church member, one of, one of our church members who doesn't have anything. And they told me about what's going on in their life, how they're terrified. They said, I feel like I need a lawyer, but I don't have any money. I can't afford a lawyer. And I said, have no fear. We have an attorney on retainer at Britain Christian Church. His name is Dan, and I'll give you his telephone number. And man, am I grateful, not only for Dan, but for the other professionals in our church who understand God has gifted them and placed them where they are so that they can help those who need their help but can't afford it. I was at the King's Clinic on Tuesday. And every time I go up there to pray for the doctors and the staff and the patients, I try to hang around for a little while and talk to people. And one of the ladies that I talked to was there with her, her brother who had a stroke. She's taking care of her brother. She's taking care of her mother. She's working at a convenience store, long hours. And I, before I prayed, I told the story of how the King's Clinic came into being. She had never heard that story. And she was overwhelmed that God's people would be so great. And so am I. And so am I. You see, those who have power shouldn't use their power to take advantage. The people who have power should use their people, should use their power to help people who need their help. Right? And the NIV translation says that they murder righteous men or innocent men. But in the Greek New Testament, it's one word the righteous, singular. I don't really know who James had in mind when he wrote that. You have condemned and murdered the righteous. Singular. But I know this. Nobody fulfills that description more than James' older half-brother Jesus. Who was maligned. Who was lied about. Who was beaten and condemned and hung on a cross. Though he was the only one who Alec Motier says this, and we'll get out of here. It is in fact surely impossible to read the words, kill the righteous man who does not resist without the lone and wonderful figure of the Lord Jesus coming to mind. He is preeminently the righteous one. The of those whose lives acknowledge only the lordship of money, not the lordship of Christ, and those who plot the pathway ahead for those who suffer as a result. Boy, folks, Money is a wonderful, wonderful tool for each and every one of us. But when we understand why God has given us the resources that he has. But if we don't understand that, or if we understand that, like if we hear this lesson today, but we walk away from this and go, man, I don't care what the Bible says. I work hard for my money, and I'm going to do what I want to. Well, then prepare. Then prepare. And that brings us to the most important decision. Every Sunday I ask you, 
If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, don't let this moment pass you by. Get up from where you're at, come to the front, give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart. I got news for you. If Jesus isn't Lord of your heart, he will never guide the way you use the resources he gives to you. Because the world stands in total contradiction and opposition to that. The Bible tells us Jesus' mission statement. For the Son of Man, the holy and glorious Lord of all, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And my friend, he not only invites his followers, he demands his followers to follow his steps. To follow in his steps. You're not going to do that on your own accord. Oh, maybe at Thanksgiving or Christmas. You see, this is really not a lesson about people that have a lot or those that have a little. About 10 or 12 years ago, there was a young guy his name was Jason. Jason was an addict when he first came to Britain Christian Church. Good guy. But he had a strong addiction issue. And he would stay clean and sober for a little while, and then he'd fall off the wagon. And one Thanksgiving came around, and Jason heard me say, for $10, we can provide a turkey for a hungry family in this neighborhood. And the next Sunday, Jason came. And he had an offering envelope, just like the ones that are in the today. He handed it to me. And on the outside it said, ten dollars for a needy family. I promise you that boy didn't have twelve bucks when he gave me ten for a turkey. So today in my study at home, there's a little frame with that offering envelope. I took the ten dollars out and gave it to Janice or whoever, but I kept that envelope. And it's sitting on my desk at home. To remind me. Man, God blesses us so we can be a blessing to others. And I've got news for you. There's no greater blessing in life that will come to you than when you say, I want to be a blessing to others. But before you do that, you must first surrender your heart to Him. So once you do that, as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Once you